Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jure Kocherman and I come from Slovenia. Uh, I work for a company called Informa, which basically works in web marketing, but also development and usability and stuff like that. My goal today is to try to persuade you to use a different templating engine different from the one that you are using now. Uh, I know this is going to be really hard, uh, but I'll try anyway. So you're probably wondering why do we need another templating engine? There's probably a lot of them, but like everything else in Perl, you have for the same problem you have 50 or more solutions. So why not make another one? Uh, usually, you find some templating engine which you like and you start using it. They are all, all more or less similar, and you work with one that's comfortable for you. Many developers don't really worry too much, too much about this or try to improve them because they cover most of the features they need. Uh, for me, it was kind of the same. Uh, and I was using this template engine and I liked it, but then I met a guy, our designer. <laughs> uh, this is not really his photo. Uh, he's kind of interesting, he looks similar to this. But he's kind of an interesting character, so he obviously likes leather, you can see that. Uh, but that's not his biggest problem. His biggest problem is he really doesn't like learning about templating engines. So we have a few projects, uh, different projects use different templating engines, and this was a huge problem because these guys only want to work in HTML and CSS, and for them it's like, I have to learn this Perl stuff too much for me. Even worse is that he uses Adobe Dreamweaver, so to write his HTML for whatever reason. And so he can't really use these templating engines because when he opens a file, it crashes and it doesn't work. So Fire him. <laughs> Fire him now. But he's really good otherwise. <laughs> they keep him as a graphics monkey and get a real front end the coding. There is another solution. Uh, so what do we do when we get uh, an HTML file from a guy like this? You have to templatize it. So you get an HTML, you have to put inside the tags, and you have to worry about all of that stuff. So for us it didn't make sense, because why do you have to templatize a template that's already supposed to be a template? So somebody is not doing his job here. <laughs> and there are templates anyway, so... The problem is, management doesn't really care how you put it inside. It's kind of uh, work that's not real work, it seems really simple to them. And sometimes you even get a screenshot, but that's a different problem. <laughs> so, what manager thinks is that he writes up some specifications usually and they send this to the designer and they say, okay, you make us the HTML and the CSS and all that stuff, and then we send it to the developer. And it's really simple work for developer, so he does it. And then it's done and the project manager says, oh, it's a really cool project and it works. That's how they think it works. In reality, you have to fix HTML all the time because some of the stuff doesn't work, he just did something wrong, you did something wrong, something wasn't planned, some labels are longer than they should be, or whatever. So, you have a solution to this, you can fix it yourself, which will probably, okay, these are just my experience with pro developers, they don't like HTML, so they just do a quick fix and say, okay, this is what you wanted, and leave me alone. You will probably hate your life because you have to do this sort of stuff all the time, and you hate HTML anyway and working with it because that's not why you signed up for this job, right? So you can send it back to the letter guy. So what usually happens is he opens up his version because he doesn't he can't open the template toolkit stuff. He opens his version, he edits that and sends it back to you. So you have to diff it, you have to find where the problems were, where the solutions are, and it's horrible. Alternatively, he fixes no, he crashes your template. So he takes your template and says, okay, I'll fix this. He can't really test it because for him it doesn't work. He, does, he can't read this template stuff. So still it doesn't work. In the end you get the blame because you are the one that's supposed to integrate it. So what you could do is you get rid of all this weird syntax that templating engines come with. The solution is, it's kind of obvious, but we don't know why most people don't do it, uh, you can use only HTML. You don't need the, really the template toolkit or whatever. 
Uh, it will work in all editors. He can open it in his Adobe Dreamweaver or whatever he likes. Uh, you can have examples there and it will still work. No more templatizing, no more de-templatizing and no work that nobody really wants to do. And having special weird text in HTML, it's just like not right. It feels wrong, sorry. So we came up with template fruit and then Rocky actually programmed it, so I didn't. Uh, it's been a real lifesaver for us and we are using it in many of our projects. So what's the trick? We have the HTML file. Uh, inside that HTML file, you, let's say this is a normal HTML template you got from your designer. In there you have some test labels and stuff like that. Then you have an XML specification for this file. There you just say value name is customer name, value name is email field is customer email. That way, Perl knows that what, what is in the pure HTML template. It, ha it hangs actually on these uh, HTML classes finds them and replaces them. So over here we have Mr. A test, see the customer name, Bob Mac test, gets replaced by this, gets replaced by this. It's really cool because uh, you can edit the stuff in, without having the actual code and it will still work when it gets on the, on the development server. So what this means is that you can send pure HTML back to your designer uh, he gets the ability to open it in his favorite editor uh, and send the HTML back to you. So when you get it back, you just put it there and it works. Uh, all you have to do is just replace the files and there's no more messing with HTML or really other stuff. Okay, but that's the, like, the simple part. You replace it, anybody can do that. So what do we do about lists? So for example, here we have uh, select. So what we did is call it iterators, you just specify an iterator in the XML specification and it gets a hang of this select and figures it out. So you can have like a normal drop down here which will get replaced by the template flute. See here it's specified and then you just send this. This is the, def this is the default value which will be selected by default. So it's much more simpler. And if they change anything, uh, they change the HTML or whatever, you don't have to just replace it with anything else. So what happens uh, in case that you want something like, okay, let's say you have a product list, and in that product list you have colors and sizes. And you say, okay, but sometimes I don't want to have them there, like if the product doesn't have color matching or whatever, you want to remove them. So in that case, you just say containers, you put the container name and the value is has specs. So you just put it in the, here in the value. You say has specs and in that case, it will show in any other case it won't show. So basically you can just <coughs> remove, uh, remove and add stuff as you wish. So template fruit, template fruit has uh, a lot more features to show then I have time to tell you here. It's got the paging mechanism and a lot of nifty stuff that you can look up on yourself at CPAN. Uh, some potentially really interesting use cases for this are that you can put, you can give your designer the access to the dev server, even if he doesn't know the templates or whatever, and then he can have direct access to it and they can, he can mess with the HTML files and do whatever he wants, delete stuff, add stuff, and it will still work. Another thing we found useful is that you can really easily send it to your customers who don't know anything but the HTML. So they don't, it's, for them it's transparent, they don't have to know anything. That it's Perl in the back end, that it's template toolkit, that it's whatever. They just edit the HTML and it still, still works when it gets back. Uh, it makes applications easier to develop. Uh, it makes people easier to train. So if you have somebody that doesn't know the templating engine, they don't have to worry about it and learn it. And it enables custom designs for customer specific needs. Uh, what I mean by this is that sometimes we do a lot of e-commerce projects. Customers want to have affiliates. And these affiliates want to have their own templates. They say, okay, we want our custom design. So instead of giving them an option just to change the logo, you can give them an access to a normal HTML editor. In, in that case, they can say, okay, I want these parts removed. I want these parts added. Uh, 
want to change something and they can change it without learning anything new, basically. So, uh, that's more or less it. Uh, what I also wanted to say before I finish is that we are holding an e-commerce uh, conference in a uh, really small village close to New York in October this year and it's aimed at e-commerce developers and e-commerce webshop owners. Uh, it's a non-profit conference so it's only $90 to get in and you get a 20% discount I think by the end of the August. Uh, it's a small resort where people will get together and hang out and have some talks about e-commerce and Pearl and there is one day of dancer training, so how to do e-shops in dancer. That's it. Questions? Uh, performance? Performance, uh, we've been running it on a site that's not actually e-commerce site, uh, but it's got quite a lot of visits, like I think about 100,000 a day and it works. Uh, I don't have any real stats for us, it's, it works, of course. So, yeah. So I'm also about uh, performance, uh, mostly uh, do, do you use some kind of caching mechanism? Uh, uh, do, or you do you translate this uh, source template into if you want some to use intermediate code and store it in file, like template to keep do computer. No, no, if you want to use a caching, a caching engine, you can use something on your own. This, this, this is not... Uh, I mean, not caching source, but the result when uh, com template uh, com translated from mm -hmm. uh, designer version. Okay, perhaps it's better that Stefan answers uh, that question because uh, he did the stuff. We don't do it yet. Uh, I mean, it will speed up a lot yes. <laughs> on production server. Absolutely. So, it be, because it's interesting thing. I think that the way to keep can help the way. There's still time. Yeah, just about a couple. Okay, shoot. Well, what, okay. what I really just want to assure me is that you don't parse the template for each and every request you serve. Uh, Rocky? We, uh, he's asking about the parsing template in every core. Could you just have a cache if it's a new page? Uh, you don't read that XML file every time somebody wants HTML. Yeah. You're not using the same approach like HTML template compiled. That's the question. Okay. You're not compiling it into the Perl. No, no, it's not compiled. So you parse every request, parse uh, so designer's version, and replace strings. Yes. Yes. It's a lot of overheat. Okay. Um, okay. It could be faster, but yeah. Well, I want another. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Did you think about using as a meta template language for as a front end to, to another template language? So you don't have this uh, performance discussions. You just say, well, if you want this, use template two. Okay, if so you want this, use HTML template compiled. Uh, as I said, I didn't actually write this stuff. But we we're just using it. Okay. Uh, so perhaps Stefan, if you can come up here and answer the performance questions. Uh, but, but if they release version with cache, I will use template. <laughs> what? I, yeah. It's easier. I finally just want to mention yeah. cache, but compiled. Yeah. What's the difference to the HTML Zoom? The difference to HTML Zoom is, I can answer this one, is that we tried HTML Zoom, uh, which existed before this, just so we're in the clear. We really liked the idea, but when we tried it in real use cases, it, for us it didn't work. And we, tr we tried hacking it, and it was, it's very, it's, much, it's faster than this. That was two years ago. Yeah, it didn't work. Yeah, it's, it's faster than this, uh, probably, because it uses a different system in the back end. But in the end, for us, it just didn't work, so... Yeah, we had to patch it also. Yeah. I was thinking about an HTML zoom, which I don't know, but similar to use something like cheaper, like select this, replace the content, the uh, mm -hmm. template with the content, is that you have to have a lot of cheaper, like selectors in your code, which ends up in like yeah. this big of thing for everyone you want to replace. We wanted basically the, the catch with this yeah. is that you can, yeah. Just a second. The catch with this is that you can basically automate it. So if you have some editor for a customer, you can just write these XML files with your code and then tell them, okay, remove this part. And for us in e-commerce, it's really useful. Okay. okay, the main reason for uh, not using HTML Zoom was 
uh, I didn't like that you have to put the class in the CSS stuff inside the code. I thought it's better to put in another file. Uh, sometimes you, you have a shop owner or something using it, and you will be able to mess a little bit around the specification, but you will not be able to mess around with the code. Okay. Yeah. Also, yeah. HTML5 data attribute. Sorry? How about you using HTML5 data attributes? Sorry, I didn't understand you. So, instead of having that XML specification. Just speak louder. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Have you thought about using HTML5 data attributes? HTML5 data. Yeah, but. Okay, it's a good idea, but you know, HTML5 is. Okay, we come from an uh, industry that's kind of very old school. Perhaps you don't think so because e commerce is like all over the place, but we are kind of conservative in these questions and we like things to really be on the market for a while before they are introduced. That's actually a safe one to use though. Browsers don't have to understand them, but your JavaScript or whatever would. Um, that's uh -huh. the nice thing about DataFoo is the W3C said this will never mean anything else, so it's just you, you putting your own variables and your own attributes. It's an interesting idea. JavaScript. It's and always for the same. Also so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I want to ask one question again before you sit down. Uh, did you think about using as a front end for other template uh, languages? Is it possible? How do we have front end for what? I mean, you, you, you take your HTML specification, your HTML, uh, HTML template language, and you translate it to template toolkit or anything else. So you don't have the hassle to think about performance. So you say that's the backend engine which cares about it. But then isn't this doing yeah. already half the work of what template toolkit would have been doing? Aren't are you doubling this part of the work for the extra? Yes, but they're doing many things like optimizing and caching. And, for example, HTML template compiler is supposed to be the fastest and all this stuff. Yeah, I didn't think about it. Maybe but it might be, perhaps it's possible to just use that part of the template toolkit. Start to plug into it. You could just, instead of output to HTML output, template toolkit code, and then pass the same data structure and now pass to template toolkit. That would be possible, yeah. Okay, just a question. I bet users of the yeah. template toolkit would like that. <laughs> I was just curious, I didn't want to start a holy war. It's okay. No, it's not a holy war. <laughs> yeah? Uh, if in some other templating engine you need a uh, condition, here in template, it means that both uh, options, uh, both possibilities are displayed uh, at once, and then one is skipped, but. Uh, you mean uh, here? Uh, yes. Uh, or? Uh, or I mean, uh, completely different uh, blocks. Uh, in the, in the template, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can basically do, you can do with HTML whatever you want. I mean, okay, stuff. Yes, yeah, so, uh, but uh, all the uh, possibilities, uh, all the options are displayed uh, at once in the, in the HTML. Present. You have a uh, docking button and the user's docking. Usually you have the same block. Um, so you would have different templates. Do you have one template? For the whole application, which includes every different uh, possible. Yeah, there are, there are two possibilities of handling. Either you have both buttons, buttons yeah. in there and filter one out, yes. or you have to the other one in your code and inject it at its place. And that's okay. <coughs> one other thing, which is also interesting, would I like to mention is that uh, Template Fluid knows about the HTML. So, all the search and manipulation. Uh, is based on that. So, if you are, um, for example, replacing something in an in input HTML element, it knows to put it in, uh, in the right attribute. It can be useful as well. Thanks. Okay, uh, we've come to an end, and thanks for your attention. And hope you will start using it. And if you don't like something, please write to us, and we'll do our best to fix it, especially caching. <laughs> <laughs>